This snowflake topic video is about snowflake performance and it accounts for 9% of the questions on the Snowflake SnowPro certification exam. If you haven't yet watched my introduction video, I really recommend that you watch it first so that you can get the most out of these topic videos. The topic of snowflake caches was covered in detail in the virtual warehouse video. For this performance topic, you should know that the metadata cache is used to optimize queries and improve query compile time. The following terms are associated with a cloud services layer. Query planning, query optimization, and query compilation. And remember that querying a materialized view is faster than executing the original query because the data is pre-computed, but it does come with a storage cost. The number of queries that a warehouse can concurrently process is determined by the size and complexity of each query. A query profile is used to analyze the execution details of a query. The query profile is accessed from the detail page for a query. As such, you can access Query Profile from any page where the Query ID column is displayed, specifically on the worksheets and history. Queries are often processed in multiple steps. Query Profile displays each processing step in a separate panel. Note that Snowflake Query Performance can be improved using clustering keys and reclustering, which I'll talk about next. A clustering key can be defined at the time of table creation or afterward. The clustering key for a table can be altered or dropped at any time. And remember that compute resources used to perform clustering does consume credits and also results in storage costs. Clustering is most effective for tables that are frequently queried and change infrequently. The more frequently a table is queried, the more benefit you'll get from clustering. However, the more frequently a table changes, the more expensive it will be to keep it clustered. And the cost of clustering on a unique key might be more than the benefit of that key. Clustering keys are not intended for all tables. When to define a clustering key for a table should be based on the amount of data in the table, the query performance of that table, and the clustering depth. Note that a large clustering depth is an indicator that clustering may be needed. The clustering depth for a populated table measures the average depth of the overlapping micropartitions for a specified column in a table. Note that an unpopulated or empty table has a clustering depth of zero. Also, it is important to make sure that the columns in the table to be clustered can provide sufficient filtering to select a subset of the micropartitions. As a general rule, Snowflake recommends ordering the keys from lowest cardinality to highest cardinality for a clustering key. If you desire to use a column with very high cardinality as a clustering key, Snowflake recommends defining the key as an expression on the column rather than on the column directly to reduce the number of distinct values. The process of co-locating column data with the same values in the same micropartition is called natural clustering. Only one cluster key, either a natural clustering key or a user-defined key, can reside on a Snowflake table. And there is an exciting new functionality from Snowflake called Automatic Clustering, which will seamlessly and continually manage all reclustering of cluster tables. Snowflake only reclusters a cluster table if it will benefit from the operation when using automatic clustering. You'll find more topic videos on YouTube and be sure to reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn and let me know if you have any questions or if I can help you on your Snowflake certification journey. Thank you so much.